If it were not for the gracious nature of God, we would have no hope of a relationship with Him. This is the fourth message in the series, Whose Friend Are You? The message is entitled, Grow in Grace. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. We're involved in a series of messages called, Whose Friend Are You? We're talking about how to upgrade all of our friendships and all of our relationships in life. We want to continue that this weekend by talking about another element of friendship or relationships. I want to talk to you about how to grow in grace when it comes to relationships in your life. This is going to be actually a two-part message. Uh, there's a number of things that I want to talk about both this weekend and next weekend that will help us to understand this idea of growing in grace when it comes to the relationships of your life. As I've said before, and I'll continue to remind you of as a part of this series, there's nothing more important in your life other than your relationship with God than your relationships with people, because not only will your relationship with God obviously affect who you become as a person, but also the people you have in your life. The people that you relate to are actually fashioning and forming you, and you're impacting them. And so it's extremely, extremely important that we're very careful about the people that we allow into our lives. As I've reminded you of earlier, when you're, uh, when you're young in life, you're a little kid, you don't have many options in terms of necessarily choosing the people around you, but unfortunately, I think we kind of adopt that mentality as we go forward, and we tend to build relationships kind of passively instead of stopping and thinking about what kind of people do I really want to build relationships with? What kind of person do I want to be that will attract the right people into my life? We talked about the importance of getting grounded. If you don't know who you are, you don't know what you believe, you don't know your own value systems, then it's going to be really hard to attract the right people in your life. You'll end up partnering with the wrong people. Uh, if you're not learning how to, be, how, to, how to be considerate in your relationships, that's going to be an issue as well because you have to learn how to, how to sort of be the kind of person that people want to do life with and hang out around. And we've been talking about some of those principles related to it. And, and I want to bring to our attention this weekend, as I said, the whole idea of learning what it means to be a gracious person and the importance of grace in relationships because I promise you, You'll never be the kind of person that people want to travel with in life, be a friend of in life, unless you learn something about the importance, the power, the dynamics of the grace of God and what God's grace is all about. So I want us to really think for this weekend and next weekend, and hopefully this will shape you in the days to come, to really think about what does it mean to experience and to demonstrate the grace of God in and through my life. To understand this, we have to start with something very basic. And the very basic thing we start with is a definition. You can't understand something unless you understand what it means. So I want to give you a, a really simple definition of the word grace. And once we understand that word, then we'll understand how it works in our lives and how it affects our relationships. Would everyone say with me the word grace? Grace. grace. The word grace is a, is a word that has a variety of different meanings, but when you bring it into its biblical context, the best definition that you'll find theologically and biblically for the, context, uh, for, the, for, the, for the definition of the word grace is unmerited, the unmerited goodness or the unmerited favor of God. Say that with me, the unmerited goodness or favor of God. Say it together, the unmerited goodness or favor of God. Now, let's break that apart for a moment. Unmerited is the key word there. The word unmerited means that you didn't earn it, you don't deserve it, it's not anything that, that you did that caused God to say, you're really awesome, I'm going to do something really good for you and favor you because you've been such an awesome person. As we really dig down into the concept of grace, we understand that grace is is really not grace unless it's something given that is unmerited. It's not because of something you do. It is another word for unmerited is unconditional. You get it on the basis of not anything you earn. And God says, I am going to be good to you, not because you deserve it. I'm going to show you favor, not because you deserve it, but I'm going to show you goodness and I'm going to show you favor because that's who I am. I am a gracious God. I show goodness and I show favor to people that do not earn it and do not deserve it. I am so glad that God is like that, aren't you? that one of his characteristics is that God himself is a gracious God. Let's take a look at some scriptures here that will help us to understand this. Psalm uh, chapter 116, verse 5 says, the Lord is, what is he? 
He is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. You'll find that there are a lot of these words that are used together, and I'll kind of bring them together for us in just a moment. What I want you to understand that if it were not for the graciousness of God, because of the fact every one of us, we're undeserving of God's goodness, and we're undeserving of God's favor. I've never been good enough to make God love me. Nor have you ever been good enough to make God love you. Not because you don't have certain elements that are nice as a person, but by the very nature that we all have, we are all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's a rebel living inside of you and me. And that rebel living inside of you and me is that thing that pushes against God. And so by nature, we're sinners. And by nature, we, we resist God and we rebel against God. But God still has shown grace and shown mercy to us, even though that we are sinners. And if it were not for the gracious nature of God, we would have no hope of a relationship with him. Think about that for a moment. There's no way, because here is God up in heaven, and here we are down here on earth. This is us. And the problem is a really big problem between God and us, and it's with us. That problem is sin. Sin separates us from God. But because God is gracious, God now found a way to deal with sin. That's through the, through the atonement of Jesus Christ. We could talk about that another time in another setting. But he's reached down to us, and apart from this very thing called grace, we could never have a relationship with God. Look at Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. Because of the Lord's great what? Love. You can also insert there the word grace because grace is a dimension of God's love. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions. Again, you could insert the word here, grace, because compassion is an expression of grace. His compassions never fail. So here we see Jeremiah says in the book of Lamentations, if it were not for God's great compassion, his love, or his grace, we would be in trouble. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, perhaps you know this passage, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So what I'm wanting you to see is that the only way you and I can have a relationship with God is not by what we do. It is by the fact that God is a gracious God and he's found a way to reach down to us. We couldn't make our way up to him, but he made his way to us in the coming of Jesus Christ. So that's how and why we have a relationship with God. It's very, very important. Now, understanding this, we are now given a responsibility as well. And 2 Peter 3, verse 18 tells us now, having received this grace of God, and what is God's grace? His unearned, unmerited goodness and favor. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. We could never be good enough to get it. But God says, I'm going to give it to you anyway because I love you. I am gracious, and I'm going to save you by grace. But now, having received grace, anybody glad tonight that you received grace? Are you glad? I'm glad I've received grace. I'm glad that God didn't look at me and say, you've got to be good enough before I'm going to love you. You got to be good enough, and then I'll love you. If you get good enough, I'll love you. But God didn't treat me that way, and God didn't treat you that way. God said, I'm going to love you in spite of your sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not suffer the consequences of their sin, but have everlasting life. And so God said, I'm going to love you even though you will never be able to earn my love. I'm going to give it to you anyway. I'm going to bring you into my family anyway. I'm going to forgive you of your sins anyway. I'm going to provide you opportunity for a new life in me, not because you have earned it, not by your works, but because I am a gracious God. But having received grace, how I many you know that when you receive a gift, you're responsible for the gift? Correct? Okay. Once you get something, you're responsible for it. Okay. So now having received grace, what are we to do in it? Right here, Peter tells us, but do what? Come on, church, help me out here, but do what? We've got grace, but now we need to 
grow in that grace, right? And so growing in the grace is two-dimensional. It's growing in the grace that is understanding more about God's grace to you and what that means to your life individually and how you relate to Him. And a lot of things we'll talk about in a few moments. But it also involves you growing in the grace of expressing God's love to other people. And so grace is, it is vertical, but it's also horizontal. So if I'm going to grow in God's grace, I need to grow vertically in an understanding of how much God loves me, because the more I understand of God's love, the more I'm going to love Him in return, and so that enhances my relationship with God, enhances my growth in God, and my understanding of God grows as I understand His grace, but also then I have to learn how to express that same grace to the people around me, and that's the horizontal dimension, but grow in the grace. There is an implied pro pronoun here, and the implied pronoun here, I like to remind people regularly, is you. But you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so we're told to do this. We are responsible. You're responsible. I'm responsible for growing in grace. A lot of people think that Christian growth, you sort of sit back and it just happens. No, it doesn't. As you, you, you have to do some things in the process, you're involved in that journey. And so in this particular series, we're talking about how now to grow in grace in our relationships with one another. Now, what does this look like? This is where the rubber meets the road. So what does growing in grace look like? Look, the Bible tells us here in Ephesians 4.32. Here's an example of what it means to grow in grace. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God also forgave you. So if you're growing in grace, you're going to be a lot kinder, you're going to be more compassionate, and you're also going to be forgiving toward each other, just like God forgave you. We're going to come back to these in just a moment. What else is, does it mean to grow in grace? Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, an object of God's grace, clothe yourselves with compassion. Here's the word again, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So now he's expanding on, here Paul is, what does it mean to be a person of grace? I'm going to break all these out for you in a moment. This is just the introduction to tonight's message. Take a look at Colossians as well, chapter 4. Let your conversation, that is what you say to people, anybody as we've talked about before, does your mouth ever get you in trouble? Okay. Is what you say ever mess things up for you? Well, here we're told, how does grace affect this? Let your conversation be always full of what? Grace. You need to get some grace on your tongue. Amen? You need to get some grace in your mouth, okay? You need to get some grace inside what comes out of here, which means you got to get it in here because what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. And so you need to learn how to talk the language of grace. There's a language of grace and there's a language of judgment, okay? And so you've got to learn to speak the language of grace rather than speaking the language of judgment. I'm just, I'm going to digress for a moment, but Jesus had his harshest words to the Pharisees and the scribes of his day because they didn't know how to speak the language of grace. They always spoke the language of judgment. They were always condemning people and speaking negative about people and putting people down. No, Jesus came along and said, you don't even understand what love is all about. And so our conversation needs to be affected by this. First Peter chapter 3, verse number 8. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic. There's another word we haven't seen so far. Love one another, be compassionate and humble. He's building this sense of what does it mean to grow in grace. In Ephesians 4, Verse number two, be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing. There's another phrase there, with one another in love. We'll come back to those in a moment. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is, read it together, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. We could take all those words and wrap them around this one concept. This is the way to be a graceful person. Love, joy, peace, patience, 
That's forbearance is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How many of you would like to be around people like that? Amen? People who are full of love and full of joy and full of peace and patience. They're kind. They're good. They're faithful. They're gentle. They know how to control themselves. That's the kind of person that you'd like to be around, which means that's the kind of person you need to become so other people will actually like to be around you. Very vital. And uh, there's one other verse I'm going to give you here before we dive into the, the lessons of this evening. It's Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Here's the very direct call related to this. Be merciful, or we could also include the concept of grace here because grace and mercy always go together. Anytime you study the Bible, you'll find mercy and grace, grace and mercy. They're like twins, okay? They're like identical twins. They work together. There's not, you can't really have mercy without grace, and you can't really have grace without mercy, and so we can link this together. Be merciful or gracious, we might say, just as your... Father is merciful. What Jesus is saying there, these are the words of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. So Jesus is saying this. He's telling us, your Father in heaven, I don't know what kind of Father you have had on earth, but he's saying your Father who's in heaven is what? He's merciful. He's gracious. He's helping us to realize that vertical dimension. This God that you serve is a father, but he's not a father of judgment. He's a father of grace. He's a father of mercy. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to be like your dad. I want you to learn who your dad is. The father in heaven, your heavenly father, I want you to get to know him. And then I want you to emulate, I want you to model the same kind of dad that you have. I want you to be like your dad. And your dad is merciful, your dad is gracious, your dad is loving, your dad is compassionate. So your kids ought to look like the dad, right? And so our Heavenly Father is merciful. We're called to do and be the very, very same. So how do we, what does this look like in a practical way? What I'm going to do, don't let it scare you because it, it could easily scare you as I say this to you. We're going to take a look at 16 characteristics. Some of you are dro- dropping out of your seat right now, okay? We look at eight this week, and we'll look at eight more next week. So we're going to break it down into to, to, to bite-sized pieces, okay? So don't think we're going to be overwhelmed by this. But I'm going to give you eight tonight, this weekend, and eight next week, characteristics of graceful people in relationships. What does it mean to be merciful as our Father is merciful? How do we look like our dad? How do we get to that place so that our dad becomes the example of our life? How do we live this out in a very practical way? Let me tell you about gracious people. So let's look at eight of them tonight. Everybody ready for this? Got your seatbelts on, ready to take off here? All right, here we go. Number one, first thing, gracious people, their identity is found in Jesus Christ, not in their accomplishments, their accumulation, or their acceptance by others. Most people in the world are trying to get their identity to establish who they are as a person by what they accomplish, by what they accumulate, or by some kind of acceptance of other people. That's where 99.9% of the culture lives. I want to be somebody because I've accomplished something. I've got some kind of title behind my name, or I've accomplished something, and people think I'm something because of what I've done, or I've accumulated certain kind of material things, and because I have this stuff, People look at me and say they're somebody because they have this stuff, or I've been accepted by the right group, and because of that, I have, I have now been put into a place of being appro- approved of by others. What I want you to see is that all of those points of identity are all based in somebody's works. What can I do to earn identity? What can I do to earn the approval of others? And I will promise you, if you spend your whole life trying to earn a a confident identity from what you accomplish or what you accumulate or the acceptance by others, you're going to live a miserable life. You never will be secure. It is impossible to have a secure identity if you're always worried about your accomplishments because somebody's going to always out accomplish you. That's what's going to happen, okay? Take a look at all the sports figures. They, they get a record, and you think, nobody will ever break that record, and next year somebody breaks the record. 
Somebody out accomplishes them. I mean, you go back and you look at some of the, uh, some of the basketball players or baseball players or football players or, or gymnastics or whatever you want to do. There's all, always somebody else coming along that's going to better what you've been able to do. Part of the reason of that is because they're standing on other people's shoulders. So life is getting better and opportunities are getting better. Accumulations, I promise you, I don't care how rich you are, somebody can eventually outrich you. How much stuff you got. You can pack warehouses full of stuff and somebody else is going to have another warehouse that you don't have. They'll have another diamond ring you don't possess. They'll have another house that you don't have. They'll have something else that you don't, and there's nothing wrong. By the way, please understand, there's nothing wrong with accomplishments. There's nothing wrong with accumulations. There's nothing wrong with being accepted by others. But what I'm telling you, you can't base your identity in that. Because if you base your identity in that, what is that going to do to your relationships? Think with me for a moment. If you're always trying to accomplish something, that means you're trying to beat somebody else. If you're always trying to accumulate, it means you're always trying to up something. You've got this competition going on in your life. If you're trying to be accepted, it means you're perhaps at times going to compromise certain things in your life for the sake of being accepted. And so it's going to affect every relationship of your life. I want you to know that you're somebody not because of what you do or what you accumulate or who thinks you're somebody. You're somebody because God says you're somebody, okay? God says, by grace has given you identity, and so you need to hold your head up high and say, I am a child of my Father God. I belong to Him. My identity is in the fact it doesn't, you take all that, you take all this away from me, all this away from me, and all this away from me, and I'm still secure. Why? Because my security is not based in those things, okay? That affects your relationships. It puts you on a grounding that gives you the ability then to love because you're, you, you can't experience or give love if these are your issues. Now, I've got to move on. I'll remind you of another passage here. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. So you can't even love without knowing his love and being secure in that identity. I had no idea I was going to preach that much on number one. I promise we get through eight. So here we go. Number two, gracious people are humble and grateful, knowing the debt they owe to Jesus Christ. I tell you what you owe. You you can never buy your salvation. Don't ever try to buy your salvation. It's a free gift. He gave it to you. Hallelujah. Jesus said, do you want to go to heaven? Do you want a new life in me? If you'll believe in me, you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I offer that to you as a free gift. You don't have to, you you owe me nothing. I paid for the whole thing for you. It's a gift given to you. Here you go. By faith, you receive grace. But now having received that grace, even though I can't earn the salvation, I want to do everything I can to show my loyalty to Jesus Christ. How about you? Okay. I want to make, I, I want, I know that I owe my life to Jesus. Don't you? I owe my few, every part of my life is owed to him. Without, apart from him, I'm nothing. Apart from him, I can do nothing. Apart from him, life is meaningless. And so even though I'm not trying to pay him back, I still know that because I've been rescued from my... See, when you've been rescued by someone and you understand you've been rescued, you, you have loyalty to the one who rescued you. Amen? You have a loving relationship with the one who rescued you. And so gracious people are humble and they're what else? They're grateful knowing the debt they owe to Jesus Christ. Not trying to buy back their salvation, but responding to it in a positive way. Let me tell you something about people who are ungrateful, just for a moment. Always remember this. and I won't take the time to write it up there. Pride and gratitude never go together. That's why I wrote humble and grateful. Did you hear what I just said? Prideful people are never, are never grateful people. And anytime you see ingratitude in your own life, stop for a minute and say, wait a minute, maybe that's not really ingratitude. Maybe it's pride. Because pride says, I deserve this, I owe this, I did this for myself, I have this, I accomplished this. As we went back to number one, and I don't, I don't have to be thankful for anybody else because I did this for me. I, okay? 
And so it robs you of any sense of humility or gratefulness. And so prideful people are never grateful people, and certainly that's the opposite of humility. Let's go now to the third point. Gracious people, they seek to live in ways that please God, not out of what? Fear. Highlight that word. I'm going to come back to it. Not out of fear of punishment, but out of what? Love and appreciation for all he's done for them. This is what... This is the kind of person you want to become, okay? Because if you become this kind of person, you attract the right people into your life. If you've been, if your identity is solid in Jesus, it's not about who, what I accomplish or get or all that stuff, no. And second, I'm so grateful to him for what he's done for me. And, and now I, I just want to please God, not because I'm afraid he's going to get me. I'm fear of pun- I have a fear of punishment. No, I, I want to obey God because I just love and appreciate him for what he's done for me. There's a lot of people that, don't, that because they don't understand this grace thing, they live in the fear of punishment. And so they obey God only because they're afraid God's going to get them. And there's a lot of people that live that way. And so every time they make a mistake in the journey, and by the way, you're going to make a mistake in your relationships with God. Did you know that? You're going to fail along the way. Everybody does. And I think that's part of the problem that sometimes with with pastors and teachers, we don't remind people, you're going to make some mistakes along the way. It's just real. Do you make some mistakes in life in general? Yeah. Did you learn to walk the first time you got up? No, you fell along the journey. And so I'm not in any way um, condoning that. I'm just making it a reality. And so if you live in the fear of punishment, when you fail, what are you going to do? You're going to hide. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did, right? They failed God. They were certainly afraid that they were going to get punished. And so they they sewed fig leaves together, and they're hiding in the garden. And God comes over, Adam, where are you? And Adam and Eve were hiding from God. And that's what happens to people when you fail and you have a fear of punishment. You hide. You hide in different ways. You hide from God, and you hide from people, and you're afraid that God's going to catch you, and God's going to find you out, and God's going to tear you apart. That's how you live your life. And that's not God at all. In fact, the real re- re- uh, reality of this is that think about the prodigal son. When he failed, when he went away from home and messed up and lost all the inheritance, his dad gave him Luke chapter 15, and he decided to come back home. It, what happened was as he's on the way home, the father runs out into the road and meets him and throws his arms around him and puts a robe on his back and a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. That's the very opposite, see, of the fear of punishment. This changes everything about your relationship with God. It allows you to get up and keep going instead of giving up or running and hiding in some way. And if you're hiding, listen, if you're hiding from God, I promise you, you'll hide from people as well, okay? You won't be able to be transparent in your relationships with people. And so are you seeing this as a a dual aspect, relationship with God and relationship with people? This is so very important. Number four, Gracious people freely acknowledge their sins, weaknesses, and failures without defensiveness or justification. Why? Because they know what's going to be the result. If we confess our sins, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he will condemn us, make us work in a labor camp for the next 60 years. No, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we, when we are living in the grace of God, we're able to freely acknowledge our sins and our weaknesses and our failures without defensiveness or without justification because we know who we're coming to. We're coming to a God of grace, okay? Again, we're not talking about condoning doing the wrong things. We're talking about the reality of how we're to live our life. This is relationship. See, God is not wanting just some kind of a, 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 a transaction with you. He wants a relationship with you. Number five. See, we're already halfway through the eight. Isn't that amazing? Okay. You didn't think we are going to do it, did you? Okay. Number five. Okay, here we go. Now we're into the next one. What do gracious people do? What do they do? Wow. They do what? They quickly forgive others. Why would you, why is that a part of being a gracious person? 
Because if you're a gracious person and you now are understanding the grace that God has toward you and you understand that the scripture says, be merciful as your father in heaven is merciful, be like your dad, okay? So what's your dad like? Huh? Anybody glad that your dad, when you come to him, your heavenly father, and you confess your sins, and you're, he forgives you, and, and so, he, so we're to be like him, right, okay? So he's our example, and so we're to then do the same with others. And so I will tell you, you have to, this is, the, the question becomes, do you do this? Do you really do this? Or are you the, the kind of person that tends to hold on to offenses, that when somebody offends you, you milk it for everything possible? You nurse your grudges. You kind of slip into bitterness. If you're that kind of person that holds on to an offense in your life or you nurse your grudges along and you, 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 you have bitterness toward people, what you're doing is you're going opposite of this very thing that God is trying to extend to you and show you and reveal through you is called grace and it's affecting your relationship. If you don't forgive someone, do you think it's going to affect your relationship with them? Yes, but it's also going to affect you as as a person, it's going to affect your relationship with God. And that's very important to understand because a lot of people don't realize that holding on to unforgiveness is doing more damage to them than it is good to them. It's poison in your own life. And so if you're going to be a gracious person, you're going to learn to quickly forgive other people. Let's go to number six. Here's the next thing. What do gracious people do? They give people a way back from their failures. That's part of forgiving, that if someone fails, you give them a way back. Let me ask you a question. We're getting down where the rubber meets the road. Amen? This is real life right here, okay? Anybody glad that in your navigation system on your car, you have a function called rerouting? Anybody glad you have that in your car? Anybody ever used that before? Has that function come in handy before? You know why? Because you get off track. And when you get off track, when you get off track, you need a way back. Okay. Now, you might lose some time. You might, it might be a little bit of a challenge getting back through the process. But I'm glad that the GPS systems in modern day world can get you back on track when you've gotten off track. What I want you to know is that God, be like your Father in heaven. And what does your Father in heaven do when someone makes a mistake, when someone fails? What does your Father do? He helps get them back where? On track. And that's the kind of, if you're going to be a gracious person, you need to develop the capacity in your life to be someone that someone can come to so that you could, you're always known as a person who helps people get back on track again. Instead of condemning them for getting off track, you help them get back on track. Amen. Can I get an amen for that? Okay. Number seven. I've got two more to go here and we're just about done. I got two minutes for two more. They bear with the, boy, it's really quiet in this room tonight, okay? They bear with the faults and the weaknesses of others. Let's, there's a word that we saw a moment ago. It was called forbearance. And here's, what, here's the word I want to point out right in this point right here. Everybody say bear with me. Or forbear is another word for it. What that means is this. Gracious people are patient with the faults and the weaknesses of others. Every person in this room and every person watching by uh, online this weekend, everybody has certain faults. Not necessarily bad sins, but you just, you have areas where you're weak and areas where you have certain faults. And you also, whether you realize it or not, you have certain idiosyncrasies in your life. Did you know that? In some element of your life, everybody's a little bit weird. Okay. Correct? Okay. Are you with me? Don't punch your neighbor right there and say, yeah, he's talking about you. No, no. It's for you right now, okay? Everybody's a little bit weird. Everybody's a little bit out of sync here somewhere. The times that we all have our own little weaknesses that come up, sometimes they're bigger than other aspects of things, but everybody has these parts of life. And so if you're going to be a gracious person, how do you want people to treat you in your idiosyncrasies? Some people like 
cream and sugar in their coffee. And some people like their coffee black, and some like sugar only, and some like cream only, and some don't even like coffee, okay? And so there's a lot of different, I mean, you think about the, the marketplace here. It plays to all kind of idiosyncrasies in people, all kind of different things of different people. The world is filled up with lots of different people, a lot of people who aren't like you, exactly like you, and don't necessarily like everything that you like. And so what is to be your response to people like that. If you're a gracious person, what do you do? Read it together with me again. They bear with the faults and weaknesses of others. Now, that very phrase, that very phrase, bear with, means that sometimes you have to bear with. It means that you have the capacity to pull back and say, you know what? I'd like to say something right now because this is really can be irritating to me but I'm going to be gracious instead, okay? Because I want them to be gracious with me in my areas of weaknesses and idiosyncrasies. I'm going to choose to be gracious with them. You know that this very one alone could solve a lot of marriage problems. That one thing right there could solve a lot of marriage problems, a lot of friendship problems. Let's go to our final one here. So wrapping up. They are what? merciful to others. I'm not going to talk very long about that one because really merciful is a, is a reflection of everything that we've talked about so far. And I'm going to wrap this up by telling you a quick story that's in the Bible. You know the story because it shows exactly what we mean by this. They're merciful to others. Jesus had been giving a teaching and he taught what we looked at last weekend. What's the most important commandment? Hear, o Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second's like to it, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, somebody comes along right after that and says, well, that's great, Jesus, that's awesome, but who is my neighbor? He's trying to kind of wiggle out of it, see if he could, didn't have to be responsible for doing this thing. Jesus said, do love your neighbor as yourself, so he says, who is my neighbor? You can read about this in Luke chapter 10. Jesus said, let me tell you a story. There was a man coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's about a 17-mile journey. I've been down that road a number of times, the road to Jericho from from Jerusalem. It's a real road, still exists in this today. You can go see it. A man was coming down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was he was he was he was attacked by robbers. He was left beside the road and and he was about to, he was basically dead and so there he was laying by the roadside and there was a priest that left Jerusalem from the temple there and he comes and he sees the man by the roadside and he and he walks to the other side and he does nothing to help him at all then there was a levite one of the people that helped prepare the place of temple the place of worship and he comes along and both of these should have known better they should have known God and known what God was like but the levite passes to the other side as well. And then there came along a Samaritan. A Samaritan was someone that would never have had anything to do with Jews nor Jews, Samaritans. They were completely opposite cultures and really completely opposite in terms of any kind of love or grace shown to each other. No mercy shown. That's why the story of Jesus and the woman at the well, the, her being a Samaritan woman, such an amazing story. It's another story, but here, here they are. Here's the Samaritan. He comes along, and a priest has already bypassed the hurting man, and a Levite's already bypassed. But the Bible says the Samaritan came along, and he saw him, and he did something. He stepped outside of himself. He crossed all those barriers and all those cultural issues that could have kept him back, and he kneels down beside the man that was hurting and dying. And he gets out the medicinal things, the oil, the wine that he could do. He begins to nurse him back to health and trying to get him up and resuscitated at some level and finally gets him resuscitated enough to get him on his donkey. And he puts the man up on his donkey and he takes him to an end and he says to the innkeeper, let's make sure we get some medical help for this guy and if you'll take care of him, just let me know what the bill is. I'll come back and pay everything because I want him to be well. Jesus said, that shows what it means to be a neighbor. That shows what it means to have mercy. And so many times in life, you can't help everybody, but you need to help the people God calls you to help. And so many times in life, we walk down along a journey and we, 
We see something that God's saying, I want you to be merciful to that person. I want you to show some grace and mercy to them. And we say, ah, I don't think I want to. Let me see if I can get far away as I can. I'm not going to fall off. It's all right. Okay. Don't want to get close to them. But God's looking for the people that are able to come down and say, you know what? I'm going to step into somebody else's world. Just like God stepped into my world. And just like God showed grace to me and mercy to me, I'm going to show grace and mercy to someone else. Those are the kind of people that Jesus wants to populate the world with, okay? Can you imagine what kind of world we would have if we had a whole lot more good Samaritans, amen? Think about it. I want you to put a comma right there because there are eight more of these things just begging for me to preach about tonight, but I'm not going to. I'm going to hold them to next week. I think we've got enough to chew on. How about, you think so? Let's pray. Father, we're so very grateful. We love you. We love you because you first loved us. We couldn't love you if you had not loved us first, Lord. And we wouldn't even know how to approach you if you had not reached down from heaven to earth and graciously reached into our lives, broken sinners and messed up people. We all are. But your love caused you to reach down into our world and your gracious nature said, I'm going after her. I'm going after you because I love you. I want you in relationship with me. Thank you for that amazing and wonderful grace. And Lord, I pray that in this moment you would help us to begin to develop the same kind of heart, the same kind of grace that you've shown to us. Help us to grow in that grace, Lord, to learn more and more of what it means to live in that gracious nature, to be merciful as our Father is merciful, to be like our dad. Build that nature into us, Lord God. Let it be real and let it be rich. Let it be demonstrated to a broken and hurting world around us. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. And you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus... I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.